Hello, I'm Paul Macklin. I'm a mathematician by day and an amateur astrophotographer by night. Uh, today in this video, I was very uh, SB Boney uh, eBay store reached out and offered to let me review and take a look at the SB 501P, which is a, uh, a 400 millimeter focal length uh, refractor uh, with some eyepieces and tripod and a nice backpack to carry it all in. And uh, this gives me a nice opportunity to try out some visual astronomy where I, I usually do photography. So this should be a lot of fun. So first I'm just going to show you what it looked like as it came directly from them. We'll take a look for the first time together and see how it, see how it came. So I'll go ahead and uh, grab some scissors and snip it open. And see what their first impressions are as they packed it. So far, so good. So now we'll slice it open over here. Maybe slice it a little bit more, but we don't want to cut it. For myself. Okay, so it's shipped in a carton here. And inside of that cartoning, it came in yet another package. So here's the whole thing. Again, this is the SV. Uh, SV Boney SV501P has this 400 millimeter refractor and a nice little uh, tripod and carry case to go with it. So let's pop it open out of the box. So let's pop it open. Mm -hmm. So they actually ship it in the carrying case itself. Plenty of gel dust kit packets, so it's not getting all moisture damaged. So let's zip this open and let's see what we've got so we have a uh, we have a package of eyepieces over here and a finder scroll it looks like so we can kind of show you what we got here this looks like it's for attaching a guide scope here's an eyepiece Here's another reflecting eyepiece over here, and this looks to me like a guide scope. Instructions. We will use those as we need to as a last resort. And here is the actual telescope. If you take a look in the packaging here, it's actually a nice. Uh, the backpack's got a lot of interior compartments, so that's nice if you want to organize things later. The telescope itself is actually incredibly lightweight. I'm surprised by that. And this must be the tripod. So let's start looking at these pieces one at a time, see what we got. So, first of all, we've got the tripod. The tripod comes in this own little bag. So let's open that up. So yeah, it's a very nice little compact tripod over here. Now, at 400 millimeter focal length, we'll see how rigid it is. So we'll have to give it some testing tonight if the clouds clear out. Hoping that we can get some testing on the moon here later on tonight. But let's see here. Overall, though, it looks like it ought to do the trick. It's got, you know, pan and tilt and plenty of all little locks. Looks like a standard 3 8 inch attachment over here. You can pull this tripod out and it has the extension. So we'll take a look at that in a moment. Now let's pull the telescope out. So everything came in nice bubble wrap. And I can tell it shipped with no problem at all. So we'll pull this out. We've got some bubble wrap and some paper inside. So we have a telescope. It's pretty basic here, but it looks like it'll get the job done. As a single speed focuser over here. It's not super stiff, so you're not gonna be hanging a camera on it, but for visual, I think it's gonna be quite nice. And here we've got the, uh, the lens cap over here. See there, that 70 millimeter aperture. So you have a 400 millimeter focal length, a 70 millimeter aperture, that gives it a speed of about 5.7. So I think we'll be able to see some reasonably bright deep sky objects. And of course for lunar, this is gonna be a nice start too. So we'll give it a go on some things here tonight uh, if, if the clouds cooperate with us. If not, we'll have to wait. 
Now, uh, let's see here. What do we got? We have a diagonal. This to me looks like what we're going to use to mount the guide scope. And since this is going to just be on a manual tripod, I think what we're going to want to do is take a look and see if we can calibrate the guide scope a bit. So we'll, we'll look at that together here in a moment and see how well we can calibrate that. See, there are a couple thumb screws here on the top of the scope. So I'm just going to unscrew those. So far, easy. We don't need no stinking directions, it looks like. Famous last words, maybe. So this is gonna be useful for attaching our guide scope. Ah, and here's where directions might perhaps be important. Which orientation do we want? So, I think in this case, maybe let's take a peek at the directions after all. Looks like you want this part facing forward. So we're gonna just put the uh, CLDs two slots here, mount right on the, the guide scope over here on these two threaded posts. And I'm just gonna then finger tighten this up. You can see though that it, this should allow some adjustments left and right because we can twist this on the scope a little bit. So we'll see how well we can adjust the guide scope and calibrate it in a moment. But I'm just going to go ahead and thumb these thumb screws back on. And that is that. As I look, I can see that I don't quite have it. You look at this black line here. It's not completely parallel to the scope. So I'm going to loosen these a little bit and just try to get a little bit more parallel. So we want the guide scope to be pointed the same direction as the main scope. Okay, so next. Let's take a peek at this guide scope. So it's a pretty, pretty basic affair here. We've got a lens cap on the front. We've got a lens cap on the back. It has kind of a helical twist that you can use to focus that guide scope later on. That just slides right into the slot over here. And then there are these three thumb screws in the ring here just to tighten up this guide scope. It's really more of a finder scope. Sorry about that. We're not going to be guiding this telescope. And we're just going to tighten up these three threaded thumb screws about as evenly as we can. And later on, we're going to see if we can't calibrate that a little bit so we can bit, have a bit better of a match of where things are going. So now we have the telescope. We have the finder scope attached. That was actually pretty easy to assemble. You can see now that there's the base where it's going to, just going to mount onto the tripod. Uh, the next thing you would want to do, it comes with exactly one diagonal. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take this diagonal. You can pull off this kind of protective cap here. This is where you're going to take then this cap off over here. And we're going to mount this right into the scope. So there's one thread right here that you unscrew. And, oh, actually there are two. That's why it's not working. But, uh, and there's a little compression ring inside that allows you to kind of put this in. I'm just going to put it all the way in. And mount it up. So this is the diagonal, kind of lets you view it at a more comfortable angle. And you can rotate it to your taste, you know, so that's gonna be helpful later on too. I can see other adjustments that are possible. There's a little ring over here. I think we're gonna leave that be. But now we have the diagonal in. Next up, we're gonna pop open the, uh, the objective lens here. And we're gonna, the eyepiece really, and we're going to pop it in right in there into the end. Again, you got to kind of untwist this a bit and pop it in and screw it in. It looks like it has again what we would call a compression ring where this, this thumb screw screws on and presses in kind of a ring that holds this in a little bit more, uh, a little bit more even pressure all the way around. So that's a good thing. I'm surprised to see it in the scope at this level, but it's nice to see. 
Now there's some good rotation of this in here. So it's a little bit more slack than I expected. I can't seem to tighten up this into the objective. I can, however, kind of screw it in a bit more. So maybe that's what I need to do. And then I'm going to actually just take this mount here and just rotate the whole thing, the eyepiece altogether. And that seems to be a bit better. So now we have the whole thing assembled. Um, the eyepiece came in kind of this canister, so kind of a word of warning. There's nothing to just stick over the eyepiece to protect it once you've got it assembled. So you're, when you pack this thing down, you're going to want to pull out the eyepiece at the very least and protect that when you're, when you're say, traveling with a scope. Okay, so now let's grab the tripod. See there's a little threading over here. And on the telescope, there's a little bit of a thread as well. I'm just going to put it on the top of my table for now. But let's see here, we should be able to just thread this in. Yeah, see that there are two smaller holes there in the center. And those are where you're gonna thread the scope on. Now it's daytime, so your question might be, what on earth would we want to do? But this is actually a perfect opportunity to just, first of all, get a feeling for the telescope and aim it at something more uh, terrestrial. Now you may notice I've kind of made a mistake here. It's backwards. Let's rotate this around. So now we can kind of give it a look at this tripod. So it's got this kind of a thread unlock, kind of like old video camera tripods. Twist counterclockwise to unlock it, clockwise to lock it, and that gives you a lock on the, the, the tilt here in particular. And then there's another lock right here on the side of the tripod right here that would you let you lock uh, more of it. And then there's this lock over here that locks the rotation on that axis. So here we have everything assembled. So now you can see the telescope all set up on top of the tripod. It's looking very nice. And what I really suggest actually when you're first using a telescope is that you pull it out in daylight first and you pick something prominent. So if you look out there in the distance, you can see the peak there of the roof on that house. And so what I've done is I've taken the telescope. I doubt we can see it through here, but we can sure try. Yeah, there we go. So I've roughly centered the telescope on that peak. And I locked in the tripod as well as I can, just kind of tighten the knobs. And then here's where you're gonna to want to calibrate the finder scope. So this, I don't know if we can actually try to get an angle on this through here or not. One thing to note is that everything in the finder scope is inverted. So see how it's upside down and reflected left and right. So that will affect it. This is not the calibration we had out of the box. And so what I suggest you do is once you have your telescope aimed, then loosen these three rings here on your finder scope and hold that guide scope in place while looking through it and kind of tighten all three of these until you get the middle of that crosshair pointing about where you have it centered in the in the scope for this kind of scope that's probably about the precision that we can expect to get but it gives you a good start and it's way easier to do this on something you can see in the daylight than trying to aim your telescope and then calibrate it to something at, at night in the dark we're going to try a little bit of test footage here just to kind of show you some views through the eyepiece what you can see here is that I've picked up a little cell phone holder that can more or less clamp onto the eyepiece. And then you use a couple axes here, primarily this one in the back, where you can slide your phone up and down until you line up the camera with the eyepiece. So now I can actually show you kind of a live view through the telescope. Here I'm just focusing on some trees across the street. See that's gathering light pretty well. I'm focusing a bit here at live, but here you know, we're seeing pine needles and some fine detail, so that is not too shabby here. As a first test here at night, I took the telescope and pointed it up at the moon, adjusted the, uh, the phone to take pictures at a variety of settings, and we just really need to test this out, try different f-steps, different exposure times, shutter speeds, you can go into the advanced mode on your phone to do this. 
And here you can see just a few examples of taking test shots through the attached cell phone on the eyepiece, like I showed you just a moment ago. And you can definitely see that you can see, you know, some clear features in the moon. You see craters along the terminatrix, uh, which is kind of like the dividing line between the dark and the light parts in the moon. You see that different craters will show up nicely at different times of the lunar cycle in the month. And so this is definitely, I think, kind of one of the ideal places to start with this telescope. And one of the ideal use cases is to give the amateur astronomer, uh, kids, uh, beginners, people who are just kind of getting going, an opportunity to really look at the moon and, and see it a little bit closer up and, and focus in. So that's one really nice use of this telescope. Another great use of this telescope is to start looking at the differences in the stars and their colors as you look at different constellations. One of the more striking uh, stars to look at here in the summer is Antares. That's one of the stars in the constellation Scorpius. And so here I can show you some sample images looking through the scope, through the finder. And honestly, it didn't do the colors justice. You can really see them quite crisp and bright when you're doing this as a live visual observing instead of through the cell phone. But taking some pictures through the cell phone like we see, you see this bright you know, yellow red star here in the star piece, and that's Antares and it's a red supergiant. And so one nice use case, again, for early astronomers is to take a look at different stars in different constellations and really look at the different colors that you can see. Uh, in the winter, you might want to look at uh, the heads of Gemini, the Castor and Pollux, because they'll actually have some very different colors. And this will be a really nice treat in the winter. Uh, or look at Betelgeuse, which is kind of like on the shoulder of Orion in the Orion constellation. So this is really showing that you can definitely see differences in colors through this telescope, th through this visual observing. So as one last test, and a really nice way to do some introductory uh, astronomy is to look at what look like just bright stars. If you zoom in, turn out to be double or triple stars. One great example is found in the, in the Big Dipper, kind of the, the cusp, the ladle there. And you zoom in and there is a double star of Mizar and Alcor. So again, to the naked eye, it just looks like a really bright star. But if you zoom in, you can see these two stars very brightly together. In fact, you can see other stars nearby too. This telescope is very capable of resolving these kinds of double and triple stars. And there's a whole catalog out there that you can find. You know, Google is your friend here. But this is another great way to get people uh, really at the beginning of astronomy uh, to use a telescope like this for visual observing and start looking for these double stars. And often you'll see that there'll be differences in colors again, just like we looked at Altar, um, I'm sorry, uh, Antares just a moment ago. So it's a really nice use of this telescope. So really, you know, kind of inclusion, this is a nice telescope. Uh, it is very, very lightweight, easy to bring with you, can set it up in a hurry. Uh, the finder scope can be a bit of a trick to calibrate. Once you do, it's very nice. I'd say some of the ideal use cases are for lunar observing, looking at double stars, um, particularly looking at differences in colors between different stars. And of course, you can use it in the day too. So this might be a nice telescope to bring along if you're looking at landscapes across the way or if you're doing bird spotting or bird watching. So a good telescope to start off with. Now, one, you know, some cautions, you know, don't expect to see Hubble telescope views. You know, I did try this out myself to look at some of the brighter deep space objects like uh, say the North American Nebula, which is well within the, say the, the, the power of this telescope in terms of zoom, but it's not quite fast enough optics to really see the colors of the nebulosity. There you really need long time exposure, something more like, uh, you know, astrophotography there. So ideal use cases more are gonna be things like lunar observing, looking for the double stars, looking for differences in, in star colors. The other exercise I actually tried, but I didn't have a chance to photograph is looking at uh, Jupiter and Saturn. In particular, this is really kind of where Galileo was. You go and look at Jupiter, and through this telescope, you're going to be able to see some of the major moons. And if you're to look from night to night to night, you'll actually see those moons change in position, even over hours by hours. So I'd say that would be one of the most fun things you could do with this telescope, is really kind of see the way some of the earlier pioneers looked at stars and planets and really start seeing those changes. So thanks for tuning in for this review, and I hope that you get to enjoy the scope.